All right, Matt, welcome to episode 42 of the Performance Advantage podcast. We're talking alcohol and sport with the world-renowned expert, Dr. Matt Barnes. Matt Barnes just happened to be Matt Miller's next-door neighbor in his office and was my PhD supervisor, so it was great to have a sit-down chat in person with him. We also have a quick update from Matt and myself as to what we've been up to, and we have our giveaway. In terms of the giveaway, we said if you left a review for our podcast, preferably a positive review, uh, we would pick one of those reviewers and give them a training plan for free. Yeah, there could be a negative review actually as well, but we don't really want that. So, turns out, despite being 2020, it's awfully hard to, one, leave a review, and two, actually see who's left a review. So, we're giving you an extra week this time, all you have to do, help us get the podcast out there, share it on your Instagram story and tag at MTB underscore PhD and at Dr. Will O'Connor, D-R, Will O'Connor, all one word. So we're giving you some extra time. It's much easier to share a podcast via Spotify onto your Instagram story. In our sphere, they're pretty much all on Instagram. So you just go into Spotify, click share, put it on your story, tag us. And we're still giving away a training plan, especially for the start of the year. So all you have to do is share the podcast. Yeah, I just uh, made a six-month ultra marathon training plan with downloadable workouts that get sent straight to your Garmin, valued at two hundred and fifty bucks. So you could you could be getting that one. All right, Matt, just quickly, what have you been up to? I was at your house, but you weren't there. So I was watching your house, and I was mountain biking in Rotorua, and it was amazing. So all weekend, I tried to stay away from work, air quotes, and I only opened my laptop a few times just to download a bit of data that I had recorded on the brake power meter. Other than that, it was fully chill mode, and it was awesome. I did manage... To one, not get drunk, although I felt like I probably could after listening to Matt. Anyway, also <laughs> did my, my last long run. So now I'm like, oh, oh, you know, a bit edgy. Now I'm just tapering. Oh, tapering is something else. But yeah. I put a, um, so my new YouTube channel is up and running, getting some good support. So I put up my, my 60k vlog. I checked in pretty much like every 10 kilometers to, to say, you know, how it's all going and how I, what, what sort of sections, like what my goals were within, within those sections, gave some cool footage of the course because I was on the Tatawera course. So any of you that are running that haven't checked it out, check out that video is pretty sweet if I do say so myself. Yeah, I was actually watching your YouTube video in your house. It was like you were there, but you weren't there. Did you see, did you see how I put Matt above Miller Road. I guess I didn't watch that closely, mm. but I'll, I'll have to go back and check it out. Yeah, so any of you listeners, it's, uh, maybe about after the first minute or so, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> All right, Matt, let's, let's get on with this interview because it is a stellar. Can you just give us a quick rundown on who Dr. Matt Barnes is? So Dr. Matt Barnes is a world-renowned expert in alcohol and sport. So back in the day, no one really understood what was going on when you were drinking alcohol. People thought actually maybe it helped you in sport. And what he did is he came in, he's like, okay, we need to look at this again and see how it actually mixes in with how we treat alcohol and how is that affecting your recovery if you have to exercise the next day, play a match the next day, things like that. So he was really interested in rugby and he looked at all the biochemical markers, all the performance um attributes before and after drinking alcohol so mostly the next day kind of thing so we absorbed a lot of information about alcohol just by being around him and he also absorbed some information about you know kind of the things that we were doing because he mentioned mountain biking when we were talking about eccentric contractions which some people don't even believe exists in mountain biking (laughs) so it was cool for us to be able to absorb that information and i still learned a lot actually while he was talking And I think it's really applicable to anyone in any sport. And you might learn a thing or two and maybe chill out a little bit more. 
<laughs> yeah, I was, I found, yeah, some, some great, great takeaways from Matt's research and just one little story about Dr. Matt Barnes. He was a supervisor of mine and my study was all around low carbohydrate, ketogenic diets. He's a big, big dude powerlifter and he goes, Oh yeah, well, you know, as part of scientists, we love to experiment on ourselves. So he tried the low carb diet and being 120 kilos, which is, I don't know, maybe like 300 pounds. Uh, he's got to eat quite a bit of calories. So the, the most extreme low carb lunch I think I saw was when he got a camembert, like a roll, you know, like a circle of camembert, cut it in half, not like, like through the, through the side. So it acted like two pieces oh. of bread and then okay. put salami between the two up top and bottom and then ate that as a sandwich. Okay. So it's like, I, I, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're using the cheese as a bun. Yep. Wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah. So I thought that was like, that's hardcore, man. That is some serious <laughs> calories. Just anyone want to try that? Go for it. All right, Matt. Let's, uh, let's put, put Dr. Matt Barnes on. All right, Matt. So we've got Dr. Matt. Barnes here and we introduced him so I guess concentrating on alcohol research during his PhD um, so does that mean Matt you just got drunk the whole time? Oh I didn't but a whole heap of people did <laughs> well no not really but it's um, the only way to get through a PhD isn't it? <laughs> yeah I've still got a bottle of vodka in my office actually which is probably 10 years old I don't know if it goes off but <laughs> it's still sitting there ready for another study yeah I think everyone's got a bottle of vodka sitting somewhere right? <laughs> I still got a bottle that I brought on the way to the UK in 1999. <laughs> brought it back with me. A good year. <laughs> it was just water now. Yeah. No, there was, uh, there was some, some good nights in the lab for sure. Um, but interestingly, yeah, no one was really that boost because um, we looked at breath alcohol and um, most of the guys after my studies anyway, my control studies, in theory could have driven home. Oh, wow. quite concerning when you look at their behavior in the lab. And <laughs> I do remember because I'd arrived here um, at Massey just after you'd finished all that research, yeah. one of the guys, Zach, he was saying there's no way he would have driven home. I think it was Zach yeah, or yep. Blake and, yep. and he was like, there's, I was definitely over and they, they were all under. Right? Yeah, at that time the, the breath alcohol limit was I think 0.8. Um, it's now dropped to 0.5. Um, but that sort of just illustrated how much you could drink to and stay within that limit, even though you felt like there's no way I would drink. And there was there's been some stuff done in the media. It sort of rolls around the same time of year. year. You know, people think, well, let's see how much you can drink and, and drive and all the rest of it. And you back in those days when that was that high limit, which was one of the highest in the world, you could drink. You know, these guys, um, the biggest guy doing the study would have been say 110 kilos. So the dose we were using that would have been um, 11 standard drinks in an hour and a half. And he could drive. <laughs> and, and, and he could have, dri he could have driven, right. and I, you know, did breath alcohol half an hour after. And, and according to that, he would have been okay to drive, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah, and that was the case right across the board. So that dose, yeah, was, had a pretty similar effect on everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, quite, quite concerning. But when you look at their, I guess their, um, their motor control, you know, often we'd have a PlayStation set up and they'd be playing games in the, in the lab and you could see their performance deteriorating. Cause but they got better for a certain amount of time probably. Like playing pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get <laughs> like really good and then it's at a certain point you just aren't good anymore. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd stagger the guys through. So you'd have one guy doing the exercise and then he'd start drinking and then you get the other guy on the, on the machine and they'd start exercising and then the other guy, and they would have been playing you know, potentially playing this game, I think it was Tekken or something like that. It's pretty even. And then as as one guy started to get a bit more boozed, his performance started to drop off and the other guy would start, you know, because he was relatively fresh, he would be dominating and then kind of towards the end of the night, they're both as bad as each other and, you know, I think the scores were always pretty similar just because of the effects of the alcohol. But you could clearly see the the, um, the cognitive side of things, yeah, which we, which we know is the big effect of alcohol, right? That's 
That's why we drink it, the cognitive effect. We don't drink it for any other reason but to make us either feel more confident. Um, I don't know, some people might say they like the taste of alcohol and that's why they drink it. No. Um, most New Zealanders tend to drink to get drunk and they go for that, that cognitive impairment, I think. Um, yeah, so, yeah, there, there was, uh, there was some good, certainly some, some good times in my lab. So, if we should backtrack by, well, like, what, what was your study? Like, what did you want? Like, why alcohol? Yep. Why sports? Like, what, what was your PhD? Like, did on? you, did you just get into sports science to study alcohol? Like, is that, <laughs> you know, like, cause sudden, like, you're an expert in yep. alcohol and exercise performance. Like, what was the journey to get there? Why did you want to do that? Yeah, if we backtrack even further back, I think about my relationship with alcohol. I was a rugby player and I played pretty at a reasonable level. Um, and I certainly indulged in plenty of, plenty of alcohol as a young man. Uh, I managed a, a student bar in Dunedin. Um, so I saw those sides of alcohol. And then, um, you know, I studied here at Massey and came through and, um, Professor Steve Stannard was, uh, was my supervisor and I was lab manager here and I, you know, got to know Steve really well. And, um, he organized a, a conference on sport and alcohol over the Massey Sport and Rugby Institute. And, and on the back of that, you know, we, we kind of realized there's been a lot of research done on, um, I'm looking at how alcohol affects your performance when you when you've had a few drinks, and that's not a real, not very realistic scenario. Not many people that I would know, other than those maybe playing third grade or president grade rugby, where they <laughs> might have a drink at half time. Nobody else really drinks before perform, before performing exercise, right? So the realistic thing is that you do some sort of sport or exercise, and then to celebrate or to make yourself feel better because you've lost or whatever, you have a few drinks or just to socialise. That's the realistic situation. And that's, so that's kind of where we started off in the first study was for my honours. And we thought, well, let's have a look, put some guys through some, some damaging exercise, so damage a muscle, um, which is commonly used in our area, you know, hard, uh, eccentric exercise to bring about DOMS, which most people will be familiar with if they've done exercise before. And then give them a set amount of alcohol afterwards and track force production through the next 60 hours or so. Um, which, if we think about, that might represent, say, a game of rugby. You play, the muscle gets damaged, you go to the club rooms and you have a few drinks. Maybe you'll have a few more drinks afterwards. And then the next couple of days are often a write-off, either because you feel too tired or too damaged or fatigued from the rugby. Or you've got a hangover, or maybe a combination both, right? of both, right? Yeah. yeah. So that was that. That was that thinking. So we set that study up and and got ten guys through. And the dose we used was one gram of alcohol per kg of body weight. So you know, an eighty kilo guy. That's eight standard drinks. Um, so they did the exercise, gave them a feed after the exercise. So I remember making ham and cheese sandwiches for all my participants <laughs> and weighing out ham and cheese and all the rest of it. Very technical, um, very time consuming, probably a waste of time. But we, we made sure they weren't drinking on an empty stomach after exercise. Then half an hour after exercise, they started drinking and they consumed uh, a drink every 15 minutes or they had 15 minutes to, 15 minutes to eat, uh, drink each, each drink over a total of an hour and a half. And so it was vodka? It said? was vodka and orange. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So vodka and orange, um, tried to mask the, um, the flavor a little bit, but it's pretty hard to hide, you know, because ideally you want to have a blinded treatment so guys don't know whether they're drinking alcohol or not, and that's almost impossible. Um, so, and then they'd come back in another time and we'd do damage the other leg and give them the orange juice, so isocaloric, so same energy content, same volume, um, everything pretty much the same except there's no alcohol. Um, and randomise that and cross it over so it's all nicely balanced. Um, so those guys always suck that Tekken then, probably? <laughs> guys that had the orange juice? Because <laughs> no one's good at Tekken, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there was Tekken and then I think I watched, um, I watched Commando, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger Commando about 15 times through the course of that study <laughs> and, and possibly the Waterboy, uh, you know, eight or nine times as well. So yeah, got a bit, 
got a bit thin by the end of it, but that was all right. The guys were entertained. Um, and, and yeah, and, and what that showed was that um, if you drank after damaging a muscle, the, the amount of force that you lost was almost twice as much as if you hadn't drunk the alcohol. So, you know, you, you might have lost, I don't know, 15%, 20% of your the, the force-producing capabilities of the quadriceps muscle group uh, 30 hours or 24 hours after with the orange juice, but with the alcohol that was, you know, another 15 to up to 20% greater. You know, one guy, um, he was a really good responder, he lost 40% of the function of his quads. You know, you've got, it's a brutal, it's a brutal form of exercise. You've got guys falling over in supermarkets or falling down <laughs> stairs because they can't produce the force to stop the, <laughs> stop the limb kind of giving way. So for any, like our listeners, I guess, like a lot of them would be runners and ultra runners. Yep. Like, so you imagine running, uh, I don't even know, as hard as you can downhill for like yeah. an hour. <laughs> that, that's exactly it. You know, it is, it's, it's running downhill. So eccentric contractions when the muscles are used as a, as a break and running downhill is a really good example. The worst muscle damage I ever had was done, running down the far side of, um, the Tongariro crossing, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not a runner. Yeah. Uh, and I got separated from my group and I thought, well, it's going to be easy. I'll just run down. I don't know how long that took, but I was, I probably could walk for a week after that. My quads were absolutely smashed. Yeah, well, to paint a picture, <laughs> um, what did you, how tall are you, 195? Yeah, yeah. About 120 inches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. Putting, that, yeah, putting that down a hill. <laughs> well, you probably hurt the yeah. ground, actually, too. <laughs> yeah. It was good on the way down, but, yeah, the next day I was like, oh, my goodness, and then the day after, so... And that was with alcohol, um, so who knows? You know, <laughs> that was I might still be recovering now if I, <laughs> you know, if I had a few drinks afterwards. Um, so that, that was the initial study. You know, it, it showed us that the interaction between post-exercise alcohol consumption and muscle damage has an effect on, on your ability to recover because the amount of force that was, was decreased, even though the rate of recovery was pretty much the same, the fact that you're starting at a lower point means that it's taking you longer to, to come back up to that baseline level. So you're probably, when the muscle is really badly damaged, you, you're probably reducing reducing the time to recovery by, or increasing the time to recovery, sorry, by maybe a day or, or, or two. Yeah, it's going to take you a couple more days to recover. Yeah, because that was one of the big ones, that I, the big <coughs> sort of findings that I remember. Yep. It's like, wow, like, because at that point, I'd, yeah, definitely get pissed after most of my races. Well, it's yep. a super real situation. Like if I yeah. think of all the mountain bikers, that's like the first thing that you do. Like you finish yeah. your ride and then you hit the beers. You're probably not hitting six of them because you're driving home, yeah. but most mountain bikers are putting yeah. alcohol into themselves at some point after yeah, they ride. I think, I think that might be all right, you know, for mountain bikers because what, what I've shown across a number of studies because we, we did that study and then we redid it again to make sure because a finding one off is just something that that might happen but you need and I, I don't think this happens enough in science you need to repeat the study to see if it actually happens repeatedly to say that alcohol has an effect on your recovery right one off yeah we could glorify that and we could go and we did we went out into the press and all the rest of it and they, they had lots of fun with that but one study doesn't mean it's going to happen all the time so we showed it over over the course of um, three studies, repeatedly, that if the muscle is damaged through strenuous, unaccustomed eccentric exercise, then alcohol is going to have an effect. Now, mountain biking, like most cycling, is going to have, well, mountain biking might have more of an eccentric component, I suppose, because you're up off the saddle and you're absorbing the vibrations and things. So, unlike road cycling, I'm quite a mountain bike expert. Um, <laughs> but the level, yeah. the level of damage is not going to be the same as 300 eccentric contractions or even a heavy squat session. Um, so, I, I think the findings are very, very specific to a damaged muscle, um, and I think your, your, your concentric-based sports, cycling, swimming, probably. We can't apply that, and, and everybody wants to apply that knowledge and say alcohol is always going to be bad for you after exercise. Well, no, it probably isn't going to be, right? And, and that's it's going to depend on the, the state of the muscle. And if it's injured, and that's always been a, a recommendation, if a muscle's injured, you don't drink alcohol, right? Because it can increase bleeding, and although that's only been shown in sheep, um, there's no proof of that in humans yet. Right? So, but. 
that that obviously leads that there's a very obvious next question to that and people are thinking well that must mean that if i have alcohol after my ride that it's good for me well because i've <laughs> you see that kind of thing right yep, like yep. you see in them like you know have a glass of wine every night and that's going to be good for you it's not because of the alcohol per se it's because of the antioxidants or something yeah right? yeah but, i mean the, the thought that alcohol is good for you is quite ridiculous okay <laughs> and, and i started by saying i used to dabble in a fair bit of alcohol consumption i don't have anything um you know against alcohol and people will drink how they want to drink and i'm not you know going to say nobody should be drinking alcohol but to think that it's good for you in any possible way is is you know is kind of ridiculous now there's so much evidence to show that even there's a big study done i think it was published last year or the year before this big meta-analysis that they looked at alcohol harm across the, the globe. Massive, massive study. And they showed that even one drink on a regular basis can shorten your lifespan. And it will uh, increase your risk of... Well, alcohol consumption is linked to 200 different illnesses and diseases. And now they're saying that even one, one drink on a regular basis can increase your risk of getting things like cancer, um, cardiovascular disease, a whole heap of different things. So, and that's, and red wine, you're talking about red wine and there's, you know, there's perhaps things in red wine that are good for you. That's really only been shown in females, right? This cardioprotective kind of thing, where it might be good for heart health. That's all good, but we know that a smaller, even a small amount of alcohol increases a female's chance of breast cancer. So it's kind of, do you want to protect your heart from cardiovascular disease or do you want to get breast cancer? You know, it's kind of, to me, the, you know, the, the risk is quite great. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no, there is no benefit to drinking alcohol because um, at any at any stage, it is like a poison. Because yeah, what it's what a toxin. is yeah, it's alcohol toxin. like? Yeah, alcohol's um, it's toxin. It, it's the fourth, you know, behind carbohydrate, protein, and uh, and fat. It's termed the, the fourth macronutrient because it. It does deliver energy to us, uh, so it's what seven um, seven calories per gram, right? So per gram of alcohol. So a standard drink in New Zealand and in most countries is ten grams of alcohol. Um, so that's uh, a three hundred and thirty ml can of beer or a stubby of beer, a standard glass of wine, and most people would pour far too much into their glasses of wine. <laughs> so that's not necessarily a standard or a shot glass of you know thirty mils of. Um, of a standard spirit, that's going to be 10 grams of alcohol. So that's a standard drink. Um, so it's, you know, it's giving us, um, it's giving us energy. Uh, the body, when we drink it, metabolizes alcohol first because it's toxic. It gets it out of the system at the expense of metabolizing carbohydrate or fat. Um, so if you're sitting down and having a glass of wine or a shot glass or whatever with a meal, then that's going to be you know. Who's having a shot glass of the meal? <laughs> <laughs> you don't? <laughs> Tequila with your, with your, ta- with your tacos? <laughs> um, Gross. Um, yeah, probably a bad, bad example. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm having a few shots. You're having a few shots with your, with your Sunday roast with your grandma. Um, that alcohol is going to be preferentially metabolised. It's, it's gets broken down um, in the liver, preferentially, as I say. Um and then what happens is, um, you know, the byproducts of that metabolic process enter the bloodstream and they get shuttled around the body and other tissues take it up and, and they're going to use that, um, that, that sort of metabolic byproduct again, preferentially. So, um, if that's present and available in, say, muscle tissue, um, you're not going to burn fat as energy or you're not going to burn carbohydrate because of this, this other, you know, this other stuff that's there. Which means there's a potential um, that you don't use fat, right? So if we drink a lot of, and they say you know alcohol can affect, can make you fat, well that's slightly true potentially um, because it does provide substrate for other tissues to produce energy. Now it's going to get broken down by the the TCA cycle and and whatnot, like like fat does um, and carbohydrate does. But at the expense of other other um, macronutrients, so um, then we use that, and we're not using energy from other sources. And if we're eating lots of food and drinking lots of alcohol, then we're probably going to end in a um, 
in an energy surplus and that'll be stored. So, you know, that's that's kind of alcohol. Um, in terms of its metabolism, we metabolise about six to seven grams of alcohol an hour. So not quite a standard drink every hour. So if you wanted to maintain uh, a low or a zero breath alcohol level, you drink very, very slowly over a period of time. It's just that we don't drink like that. We drink fast. You know, you can drink, oh, I don't know. The stubby seems very small to me. Um, you know, it's two mouthfuls kind of thing, probably. Is that a, a what, what's that? A what's can. a stubby? That's a, okay. That's a, you stand a can of It's 330 okay. mils, you know, that's okay. not a like lot. Like a can of Coke. Yeah. Okay. What is okay. it? Eight ounces, is it? Uh, 12? Okay. I forget. Yeah, 12 ounces. It's, been a while it's 12 ounces. Yeah, so yeah. the standard drinks, like in the bar, you'll go and you'll buy a 12 ounce beer. That's a standard drink, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's 12 ounce, so that's pretty easy to drink, you know. Um, yeah, in an hour. Yeah, you wouldn't drink one it in an hour, hour right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, so you might, you're going to drink more than one drink in an hour. So then the, the, the rate that you're absorbing alcohol is greater than the rate that you you can clear it and it's going to accumulate in your bloodstream. And because alcohol is, um, you know, we're talking about ethanol, um, which is the, the alcohol that we drink, there's lots of other different types of alcohol. Um, because it's water soluble, it can go into any tissue in the body. It, you know, it won't go into fat, but it'll go into muscle, it'll go into the, into the brain. Those would be the two main um, main tissues, you know, brain and, and muscle tissue. And it has um, it has effects on on the function of of all of that tissue, basically, particularly the brain. The the liver of everybody pretty much metabolizes alcohol at the same rate. Um, you know, whether you're male or female you're going to clear alcohol at the same rate. Now, females don't handle alcohol to the same extent as males because they're smaller, they have less muscle mass, so they end up with a more concentrated amount of alcohol in their in their body. Right. And it would be the same with, with me and you. What do you, what do you weigh, if you don't mind me asking, Matt? About 60. So you're, six, so you're half my weight at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> <All right>. uh, <laughs> so Does that make you feel messy? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I do need to lose uh-huh. a couple of kilos. I'm, I'm well, trying. I am trying. Well, you're also <laughs> twice my height, so it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you three foot four. <laughs> um, you know, if we were to sit down here and go one for one with, you know, with shots, we come back to shots. Irrespective of our, our drinking background, in theory, I should be able to handle more alcohol, right? Because I've got more muscle tissue. Um, and possibly more brain tissue. Um, <laughs> Doesn't mean for, it all does you know, anything, but yeah. <laughs> that's right. So it's quite redundant. Um, to, to, um, to dilute that, you know, because all that tissue is full of water, so you're diluting the alcohol. Females and small people with these muscles. <laughs> females and small people. Do you know, well, insignificant you know, people. Like female and that. Females There's a bunch that. of small people out there, right? You know, um, they are not going to be able to handle alcohol the same way because it's going to be more concentrated in the, in the tissues. Of the I mean, you, there's a there's a silver lining to this. <laughs> a cheap night out. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm a cheaper day. That's actually, so. I didn't know um, that that was the reason. Like, I figured those people just metabolize it faster. But now that makes sense. Yeah. Everyone metabolizes it. There or thereabouts the same, obviously. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. But yeah. then you just have a larger sponge. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a good way to look at it. The, the liver's pretty similar size in most people. Um, you know, there'll, there'll be some variations, but they've done studies where they've looked at clearance rates of, of ethanol in males and females, and, and it's pretty much the same when it's standardized for, you know, character, body characteristics, you know, so it, it does come down to the amount of muscle mass you've got. Or, for that matter, you can get some people that are, are really big and carrying a whole heap of fat. They might be 40% body fat. Small amount of muscle mass, they're going to be quite susceptible to, date. you know, they're cheap date as well. Yeah, yeah so. For alcohol, like obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go to Burger King, drink a lot, you know. Well, that's the cheap. thing, you know, alcohol, um, while it can affect your metabolism, it also affects your food choices if you drink a lot of alcohol. It, so, yes. you, you start to overeat, you don't understand it actually increases your appetite as well. So you end up overeating when you're intoxicated, potentially. So it's disrupting metabolism, making you have do um, do bad things around your diet, and that can lead to you know to um, an increase in weight. It's been bad, known bad to weight. make vegans non-vegan for the night as well. 
Yeah, I've yeah. seen. Yes, I've seen that happen. So that's kind of a, a beer goggles for food, I suppose, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're looking at a burger and you think it's a, a carrot. <laughs> Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so al- yeah. Coming back to that, alcohol. You know, it is a toxin. It does need to be cleared straight away. Um, and it is the other thing to remember is it's contributing energy. So, if we're thinking about our diet, and, and you know. You guys will be talking to people about their diets and telling them, you know, you have to consider the energy you're getting from alcohol on top. It's a, it's a discretionary energy source. So if we think about when you look at your, your macronutrient requirements over a, over a day or over a week or whatever, you're going to plan mainly around your carbohydrate. Probably your carbohydrate might be the thing that you manipulate most, but your protein and your fat might be, depending on your type of diet, are going to be pretty stable, right? And you, you're focusing on where am I getting my energy from? Once you've met your energy requirements through your carbohydrates, your proteins and your, your fats, then your, your discretionary kind of energy can come from your, your crappy kind of food or your alcohols, you know, just to top you up. It doesn't, you've met your, you've got your macronutrient requirements sort of ticked. That's where alcohol sits in a diet. We'd never program someone's diet to include alcohol. You wouldn't say, right, this week or today you have to you have to eat you know 400 grams of carbohydrate and get 100 grams of protein and some fat but it's really essential that you get 200 grams of alcohol in your diet you know you never like you're never going to say that yeah. like pizza right it's yeah. in the same category it, it as is pizza. it is in the, in the same category as fast food and pizza and, and some of those poorer choices because it is it's, it's not essential even though it's a macronutrient the body does not need it for for anything at all unlike the other three we need carbohydrate, even in just in small, small amounts for brain function. We need fat and we need protein. We do not need alcohol. Yeah. There's no need for it. But it's still like a super, so it's a toxin. Yep. It's bad for us. We, yep. it's not a super good energy source, yep. but we still drink it yep. because of the effects that it's having on our brains. So yep. it's a social thing. Yep. Uh, for some reason, we've accepted it over thousands of years or however long yeah. it's been around because yep. of what it's doing to our brain. Yeah, so what's yeah, kind of, yeah. what's kind of happening at I that mean, level? Yeah, at the brain, um, it's potentially having a well, it's having effects on um, neurotransmitters, just Dis- disrupting the way the signals are translated through the brain. It's it's actually um, it's depressive. It has a depressing effect on us may not feel like that when you're on the dance floor and you've had a couple of jugs. You don't necessarily feel depressed, but it, it's a... Next day. You know, it's not a, it's not a stimulant. It's a, it depresses brain function and, and the way we feel. So, um, quite different to some of the other things that we take that will boost, you know, caffeine and things like that that will actually make us feel a bit more invigorated. Um, so yeah, it affects those, um, those neurotransmitters, um, in a, in a dose, um, dependent manner. So a small amount can have a positive effect on mood, for example. You feel a bit better about yourself and about your environment. And you feel more comfortable talking to people. It's an um, in, in, it's inhibition. Yeah, it's a social of inhibition. Inhibitor, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but as opposed to like, it might feel like a stimulation effect, but it's really just removing yeah. what was. Yep. Yeah. 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 So at a, at a low dose, I guess. We could think of it as being beneficial, um, but then as we start to drink more and more, we start to see those effects that we were probably familiar with when we drank. You know, a loss of coordination would be the biggest thing, and that's why we can't drive when we're intoxicated because we simply don't respond. Uh, so our response time and our coordination decreases. So your response to any sort of stimulus is is, um, is affected as well. Uh, and then up to you know when we start to to look at really high doses. Um, we're going to lose consciousness and we could die. Uh, so you could die of alcohol poisoning. Um, brain's going to shut down. You poison the brain, uh, and that's and that's it. You know, and there's always, you know, stories of of you know kids at university and orientation week that have gone. And I remember it when I was living in Dunedin, gone back to their halls of residence after a big night, and their mates have gone to get them, and they've died, you know, of alcohol poisoning. And that's. That's going to take a lot of alcohol, but it's not, given the society, the way society drinks, you know, it's, we're not far away from that often when we go out drinking, probably. Yeah. There's, there's big doses, but in reality, that's how people drink. They drink big doses. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really just surprising that like how toxic it actually is and how it causes problems actually. This is a totally separate issue, but it's like, so it just really blows my mind how it's accepted around the world pretty much. Yep. That we pur- purposely put this into our bodies to, to an extent that it can really cause harm. Yeah. I, yeah. You, you can look at, you can look at the, the harm that it, it does society and individuals and the cost on the, on the healthcare system in any, West, certainly westernized countries, but just about any country. You, you would wonder why governments don't regulate more tightly around alcohol. You know, we're, we're trying to stop people from smoking. Um, we've been pretty harsh on party pills, you know, five years ago, party pills were probably maybe longer than that. Outlawed very, very quickly after one person died on the West Coast, you know, because he had party pills with alcohol, suddenly completely banned and party pills, they're made of sheep dip and all sorts of stuff. So you don't want to be taking those. But how many people die of alcohol related issues? You know, in New Zealand every year, it's a massive number. As I said at the start, it contributes to 200 different diseases, and this is just drinking small amounts. Um, you know, it, it is, it's a bit worrying, really. One yeah. of the big, like, interesting things around alcohol, I uh, remember Sarah, who was doing the research on, like, the Heineken Open yep. and the Sevens. So in New Zealand, Rugby Sevens is like this huge, like, pretty much piss up. Mm. Um, I think for, wait, 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 wait. For our American listeners, that means you're getting drunk, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Piss up, yeah, right? Yeah. So I guess it'll be like tailgating it at the at the NFL kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can't remember if you remember this stat. I remember it as around eight or ten seconds. Every eight or ten seconds, you saw the Heineken advert. Like you saw it. So it was on the field, painted on the field. It's on the jerseys. When they scanned the crowd, everyone had a cup of Heineken. It was on the billboards. It was like the title sponsor. So when the ad came up, it was like, so you, you pretty much cannot, you, you were every single shot of the, that whole tournament across the weekend, sort of 8 a.m. till, you know, 9 p.m. was, you did not see people drinking in the Heineken logo. Right. Yeah. I do remember that. And, and certainly uh, alcohol and sport go, go back a long way. It was like cigarettes in sport. Yeah, it used to be the um, the Winfield Cup was the NRL competition, right? And Rothmans um, sponsored the one day cricket in New Zealand, and there was the and all the motor was, racing was all yep. the Marlboro. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Be the same in the states. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that was outlawed, and, and there's been a strong push to to not outlawed but regulated against. Been a strong push to to eliminate alcohol sponsorship in New Zealand, and and in other countries have already picked up on that. I think France, for example. Did away with that a few years ago and, and just replaced it with telecommunications. There's, there's lots of big corporations out there, but we're still sort of hanging on to that. But, but my question around that has always been just because you see a logo, does it, does it make you drink more? That link hasn't been proven. You know, yes, you're seeing something all the time. I see Coke ads on TV all the time. It doesn't make me drink more Coke. <laughs> yeah, you true. Know? So I'm just, you know, I haven't bought a brand new Ford. Like, yeah, well, don't tell the marketing awesome. managers, right? Because they think they're doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I, I just, I, I would, you know, there's a study I'd like to do is just to look and see whether that does, the more you show someone some form of advertising, particularly in an acute environment, like the Sevens or, or, or American football, any, any kind of game where you go and you sit and they've got advertising flashing up, does that mean you're going to go and get a beer more often than not? Yeah, I see. It's probably you're just more likely when you are to get a beer to get their brand. Yeah. Not, yeah. not to just drink, not to yeah, drink more. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, that yeah. would be my question. Does it does it question. increase someone's? Yeah, I've never really thought about drinking. it like that. Like I never see a Burger King ad. I'm still if I'm driving past this one Burger King, I it? stop at every. T- I'm going in. Like there's no question. And I've never seen a Burger King ad. <laughs> it's it's just promoting <laughs> brand preference. You know? Yeah, and that's it. it. The, the classic. Uh, and, uh, well, they're just targeting their their demographic, aren't they? Yeah. Like their audience is like people who. Sport, sport. Yeah. Like sport yeah. watchers love a, love a yeah. beer. So you're like, well, I need to get in front of them. We look at the Otago rugby team has always had that association with spades. Yeah. So, and, and being a southern man was being associated with spades. So, you know, if you can build that brand identity and hook people in that they want to be a southern man and they want to support Otago rugby, I'd better, tr- better drink this product. 
Yeah, like Bud Light and stuff. Doesn't, and just because you drink so. something doesn't make you a southern man or, or mean that you're a, a worse or a better supporter. <laughs> it, it's just trickery, which is what marketing is. Okay? Yeah, yeah. You know? this, this is a really good time for us to cut to an ad break from our sponsors. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> You know, coming coming back to we, you know what you're talking about is, yeah, I, I don't understand why we don't do more to to regulate. And I think one of the big mistakes, and when I was in the pub industry, I got out in 1999, and the following year, yep, that was right. Um, they changed the drinking age back uh, down to 18. So. So was it 21 before that, or? Tw- uh, it was 20. Oh yeah, pretty sure okay. we had 20. So, you know, with the flip of a switch or the, you know, you've gone from midnight on one night to the next day, you've been kicking kids out of a pub and suddenly you've got to let them in. And they haven't matured overnight. Their ability to <laughs> control themselves hasn't changed. And I think, you know, I think we could, from, in terms of the society, New Zealand society anyway, it's probably different in other countries. If we increase the drinking age again, and we made it more expensive to buy alcohol in supermarkets and cheaper to buy in pubs, we'd see quite a shift in probably the, the harm that alcohol does to a certain extent. Drinking in a, in a supervised environment is far better for you than drinking cheap alcohol in a flat or park or whatever. Park. You know, <laughs> yeah, or a tree. Yeah, for <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, so there's, there's, you know, and I'm sure there's people lobbying for all this sort of stuff, but... Um, the government makes so much money out of tax on alcohol that um, I don't expect them to do much about it any time soon. Yeah. 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 But then for sport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Recovery. So you were you were talking before though, before we went on the air, where yep. you were talking about the history of alcohol. Yep. Like actually using it in sport as an ergogenic aid. Right? Yeah, and that's what I say, you know, sport and alcohol have a have a very long history. If we think back, um, you know, Greek, Greco-Roman times, um, the ancient Greeks, they're drinking alcohol as a as a way of preparing themselves for for athletic endeavour, I suppose. And, and oftentimes, back in you know, if we think way back in those times, probably alcoholic beverages were a safe way of getting your fluids. You know, sometimes the the water would be pretty horrible. Yeah, I remember you know? reading that that <laughs> lot, it was lot like of impurities. They were you, drinking you know, alcohol over water because they had no idea. Like, yeah, people were just dying because yeah. of whatever bacteria was growing mm. in the water. So you know, beer's been fermented, alcohol's been fermented, and it's it, it's been purified really. So it's a safer way of getting your fluids. Um, so yeah, the, even children would drink watered down wine. So often they would water their wine down and they'd drink just drink that like we might drink juice or something like that. Sounds like a real handy excuse for someone that wants to drink alcohol. You know, you could just yeah. boil your water. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good way to do it that, too. That's right. <laughs> Those simple times. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah so they were, they were drinking, um, almost treating alcohol like an ergogenic aid, I suppose. Drinking it prior to athletic events. Um, you know whether that was wrestling or, or javelin or any of those, and, and same in the in the Chinese civilization, which is equally, if not older. Um, there's reports of athletes you know, and, and soldiers preparing for battle and preparing for competition by consuming reasonable amounts of alcohol, and that's kind of continued on all the way through from from those early times through the the early Olympics, and then if we look at the modern Olympics, you know the turn of the not, uh, what, into the 1900s, um, late 18th century, oh, sorry, 19th century, um, athletes are drinking alcohol during events like the marathon or the Tour de France as a way of staying hydrated, but also with the view that it's going to improve their performance. Um, because the, I guess the, the thought is that it makes you more aggressive, and if you're more aggressive, then you potentially go, and it, and it decreases any inhibition that you have. So you're, you're, you're more confident. You're more aggressive, and therefore you're probably going to perform better. Um, so, yeah. and that, that was the belief, probably right right through even the the 1980s into the 90s. When you look at the research that was done, all of the research um, before the stuff that we did was around alcohol being consumed, and then you you're exercising. So it was, you know, drink X amount of alcohol, jump on the treadmill, and we'll, we'll do a time trial, or we'll see how it affects. So, you know, a couple of studies, 
they often looked at different doses. They give you a dose, dose of alcohol, um, small and, and increase up, and they might look at your 100 meter performance, maybe a 400, an 800, and maybe a 1K, you know. And what they what what that showed was the more you drank, the worse your performance. Surprise, surprise. And the longer distances were affected more than the shorter distances. So your, your sort of anaerobic type exercise, maybe your 100s, 200s, um, sprint type performance, not really affected by even high high doses of alcohol. But your, your long distance, more long distance stuff, um, you know, whether you guys call 1K long distance, <laughs> it's, a, it's an awful long way for me to walk. <laughs> uh, at least it feels like that. Um, that kind of that kind of thing, you know. So that longer distance, probably that aerobic type stuff, was being affected. Um, and, and they kind of they they looked at heart, you know, heart function and heart rate and stroke volume and, and a whole heap of stuff. And um, alcohol can put a bit of cardiovascular strain, you know, a bit more strain on the heart. But um, often the effects of alcohol on the heart are being made up for by um, an increase um, contractility of the left ventricle, so it sort of makes up for anything else that's going on. So you don't necessarily see a change in heart rate or cardiac output, for example, when you drink alcohol, because the heart kind of adapts to to take care of that. Um, and it probably wasn't having a, a, an effect on these guys doing their doing their runs. Probably the biggest effect is on your your motor control and your ability to coordinate your movements. Things like running economy are going to decrease with it with higher doses of alcohol, simply because you're less coordinated. You're probably spending more time on the on the ground, and maybe you're, you're taking more steps. So there's more force, there's more energy required, and you need to more, use more oxygen. So that's probably the the effect there. So there's a dose, a negative dose response on aerobic performance. Uh, they they did one study where they had guys on a treadmill and they gave them drink before. I can't remember the dose, but it was a reasonable amount. Uh, it might have been a couple of drinks before. Partway through, they gave them a couple more drinks, and then and they looked at how long they could run. And um, I think of the let's say eight or ten people doing that, only four of them finished. The others were sort of vomiting and couldn't finish. <laughs> um, so there's some some detriment there. Um, strength side of things. Even really high doses of alcohol don't affect don't affect your ability to produce maximum forces. Again, it comes down possibly to that anaerobic side of things, and we're not we're not disrupting the way we we get energy. You might lose your balance if you're doing a nasty squat, though. Huh? Yeah, you're not going to do. You shouldn't <laughs> do resistance exercise when you're intoxicated. Yeah. You know, you're not going to go and do CrossFit when you've had a couple of drinks, or you know, do some Olympic lifting when you. Yeah. No one's going to cross with time yeah. to drink alcohol. No, no, they're like fully keto. Yeah, yeah. straight edge. Yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is keto alcohol. Yeah. Yes. Well, actually, because it's, um, they, I can't remember. So called. Where, uh, <laughs> so called. Where I was reading, um, when I was reading this, but when I was doing my ketone research, because they tried to use alcohol as an alternate form of energy as well. Right. Because of the preferential. It's the same because um, ketones are essentially an alcohol yep. metabolized the same way, metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase sure. as yep. well in the liver. Yep. Um, because you have that, I guess, free seven calories, mm -hmm. you know, that is going to be preferentially yep. metabolized. Yep. I remember looking at, yep. at that and it was the same thing where, um, same as like my keto stuff, where the body kind of just compensates. Yep. And it was maybe, maybe, Less um, shut down that fat mm -hmm. metabolism. Yep. Um, more yeah. so. I don't mm. know if you saw any, any of that. No, I haven't. I haven't seen that comparison. Um, but yeah, it makes it not between the ketone. Oh, but like, have you alcohol. seen that? The when they did that, they tried to use alcohol as an alternate. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh. Yeah, I didn't see that one. But that, I mean, that that makes sense. But you've got the effects on your brain, obviously. And yeah, yeah. You know, so. How much alcohol do you need to to drink to get enough energy to sustain a long distance run, or even just a <laughs> ketogenic lifestyle? <laughs> you know, you're not going. Yeah, it does. It, it's functionally, it's not 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 going to work, really, is it? Uh, yeah. So that's.
I remember going to all these, um, so like in mountain biking, there's these single speeders, right? They just have one gear on their bike. And when they go to events such as the single speed world championships, which you basically dress up in a costume and ride through big mud puddles and stop at beer stops, right? So it, there's a mandatory beer stop and you have mm. to like chug a beer. And No, that's, I thought that was only if you want to take the shortcut. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah? yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you can t- take the long cut, which then you eat like a dry wheat picks or something like that. Right, yeah, and that's yeah. obviously going to slow you down. So you take the shortcut and drink beer. Right, yeah. And uh, that yeah. you end up drinking quite a lot of beers yeah. through that. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I hadn't heard of that one. I'm certainly aware of the um, the beer mile. You heard of okay. the beer mile? So yeah, we've got the uh, New Zealand off-road beer mile champs coming up. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, okay. So, so you'll be there? Uh, hopefully. I need to check the date. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. usually done on a 400-meter track. and you do. That's like hotly competitive for it's, the actual... Oh, it's track. massive. Yeah. You, you go onto yeah. the, the beermile.com website and there's hundreds of thousands of, of competitions and people <laughs> that have registered for it. So you go on and you log the type of drink that you've consumed um, and your, your time for the mile. So that's you drink a beer uh, every 400 meters. Uh, there's regulations around what sort of beer... But you have to write that down. Um, you can do milk or you can do other other drinks. But um, that again, that's a study that I'd like to do as well, just to see. Well, I looked into that a little bit about what that might have, whether that will have an effect on you, and probably it probably doesn't, other than having you know volume, I think, volume sloshing around in your yeah. gut, mm-hmm. like carbonated. Volume. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that, that would anything. be the biggest issue. So discomfort. I mean, you'd probably rather than the effects of alcohol. Yeah, you'd slow down by drinking that much water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think so it's these just guys are like the pros, uh, are like professional runners that don't, they can handle their beer, you know, they can chug. <laughs> well, they, and that's some like, good. they're like sort of, I come here, there's a zone. Yeah. I think I'd have to look it up. I'm just kind of, might be speaking out my ass, but there's a zone in which you're allowed to drink in. Yeah. And then you have to consume it within that zone and then uh-huh. you're allowed to run again. Yeah. It's a yeah. bit like a relay, I suppose. You've got to have the you, on. Yeah. You can't you just like it. grab the beer and just like run. Drink while you're yeah, you've got to sort of almost come to a stop, I think. Yeah. But the times are pretty good for you know. I, I can't remember what they are. They might be. I don't know what's a good mile time. You know, the, or sub four minute mile is like the the gold standard. Yeah, so they're, they're probably five minutes or no, they're way they're, they're, they're faster than what the the, the, the guy who's like the top dude. They're faster than what I could run a mile. Yeah. Doing it in beer mile, <laughs> four thirty. Yeah, so it probably crazy. doesn't create. These are like guys who can do like a say. 350 mile. They do a 349. And then they're just doing it. <laughs> just doing 10 seconds to smack a beer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like and it doesn't, it wouldn't better. matter what they're drinking. The time would be the same, whether it's yeah. beer or, yeah, yeah. or Coke or the carbonated factor obviously yeah. makes it harder to drink. You know, it's a bit like doing a, a yard glass. I'll look, it's much I'll look easier. it up. I'll look it up. Um, you guys can but yeah, there's not too many, other than those two examples, there aren't too many times where you would drink during, you know, during, um, Competition. So that, and that, yeah, so that was the, that was the research, um, up until kind of when we started doing our stuff. That there was one study done on muscle damage and they, they drank and then they did the exercise. So they drank and then they did the, the damaging exercise and there was no effect. Um, so we kind of followed on from that and, and drank and did, then did the damage. And, um, you know, so if you look at the, I guess the American College of Sports Medicine is kind of the number one in terms of, recommendations for what you should and shouldn't do around various types of exercise and the benefits of exercise. Their position stand was written, I think, in 1992, and that was all focused on pre-exercise alcohol consumption and how it affects your performance. And, and their, basically their, their, um, their conclusion was there's no benefit to <laughs> drinking alcohol before exercise. In fact, it may be detrimental, so, you know, and, and that's, that's fine. Um, it had to be said, it. right? It does, yeah, yeah. that's right. It, they needed to take a stance on it. Yeah, that's right. Like they that, had to put something down. Yeah, that, that's yeah, right. Yeah. And they had to use the available research. Yeah. But now, we've done a lot more research since then. Um, there's still lots more to do, but we, you know, we did that muscle damage study and, uh, and, and that series of studies and, and that was all good. And, and one of them showed that probably there was, um, some sort of, when the muscle was damaged and you drank alcohol, there might be some sort of central effect, so that it might be more painful. So you know, the the brain is basically holding the, the muscle back from performing 
potentially as protective mechanisms. So we did that study, and um, uh, and then that's all good and well. That's in a lab environment, and the, the damage is really extreme. You know, guys falling over in the supermarket and downstairs and stuff's all cool. But it's not standard really, it's research. Not, it's not realistic. Yeah, you, know, you know, to to look at that model, you think, yep. And often in, in, in science, we're going to do something really extreme to to get that interaction that we want, I suppose, to start with. Yeah, to see if it's there. Yeah, and, and it's there, right? So we know it's there. So now let's put that into um, into a real setting. So with my rugby background and, and the way rugby players drink and whatnot, a design based on a, a paper from the UK designed a rugby game simulation um, that involved um, sprints, Jogs, walks, um, tackles, simulated scrums, some agility stuff, and they, they did that for 80 minutes with a half time. Um, and there's some performance measures in there, and there's performance measures before, and then the next day, and the next day. So they did that in pairs, and they tackled each other and stuff. Then they went back into the lab and they drank the same amount as we used in the first few studies. Um, and we tra- we looked at speed. And we looked at um, testosterone and cortisol and creating kinase as a measure of muscle damage for the next uh, 48, 72 hours after the game. Right, so you think that's, that's cool. The, 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 the simulation brought about the same physiological responses as a, a Six Nations rugby game. So heart rates were averaged about 172 beats per minute across the 80 minutes. Testosterone and cortisol responses were exactly as you would see in that level of rugby. Um, so physiologically and lactates were the, were the same as you'd expect from a game of rugby like that. So the stress was a, almost exactly the same as you get from a, a top level game of rugby. Then these guys went and got not drunk, but they went and consumed this alcohol or they consumed the orange juice again. So we crossed it over, they did that twice and there was no effect of alcohol on their recovery and their subsequent performance. Um, which was a, a bit of a bummer, I suppose. <laughs> you want to see stuff when you're doing science, but I think they weren't damaged enough. You know, if we think about how damaged people were to start with, these guys, most of them had played rugby that season. They're condi- conditioned to the knocks and the, the demands of rugby. Um, the creatine kinase levels, the muscle damage wasn't very high. Um, so they probably weren't damaged enough or fatigued enough. For the alcohol to interact with, so that kind of made me think. Right, if a muscle's not damaged, then probably alcohol's not going to have any effect on it. So, um, so that was that. And then the, the next step from there was that's all good. So that maybe that simulation wasn't hard enough. Maybe guys needed to be tackling harder or whatever. So I supervised uh, uh, a master's student, and we looked at we got two game two rugby teams played each other, and this was a different approach. So. I wasn't going to be able to get ethics to give guys a higher dose. I'd already shown that one one gram of alcohol was detrimental to recovery when a muscle was damaged. Hard to go higher. So we took what we what we termed a naturalistic approach where the guys went and consumed alcohol by themselves and they reported back. There's some limitations around that because once you've had a few, you don't necessarily keep track of things all that well. Um, but we had two teams play each other. We did performance measures before the game and the next day and the next day. So we're kind of simulating a Saturday game, a Saturday night of drinking, a Sunday night and then a Monday, uh, sorry, a Sunday and a Monday of, of recovery kind of thing. One team went out and drank what they'd normally drink and the other team came into the lab and we, we fed them and we rehydrated them, we entertained them for a bit, we got them to watch movies. You didn't play Tekken, did you? We didn't play Tekken, we watched <laughs> know, Commando. Um, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we sent them home, and they did. They did everything that that you would, you know, by the book. You would say this is going to enhance, this is going to be best for your recovery, hydration and, and glycogen synthesis and sleep. Um, and then we got the two groups back in, and they they did all their tests again, and we looked at hydration status, and, and that was pretty foul. You know, some some of the guys were chronic. They were all pretty much chronically dehydrated. But after after the game and after a night on the booze, you know, some of the urine samples looked like. Um, grainy Fanta. 
<laughs> with a thick head of, you know, like a like, it looked, looked like, like beer. <laughs> it, it looked like a spider, you know, with the ice cream and the yeah, yeah, and yeah. you've got a bit of a, it's disgusting. a head on it. So, um, <laughs> so you know, we looked at mainly anaerobic ability, so um, repeated sprint ability. So that's um, six by forty meters going every thirty seconds, which is hard to do. When you're not hungover. So we're looking at a hangover, I suppose, at this stage, um, particularly the next morning. Um, a mid thigh pull, so a measure, isometric measure of, of lower body strength. Uh, vertical jump, so a measure of power. Um, we, oh, we looked at, we did blood sampling and we did the, the hydration stuff. We did some cognitive stuff, but that was, that was really messy. Um, but what we found was these, the guys that went out drinking and, Average alcohol consumption for that group was 19 standard drinks for that night. Was the average? <coughs> was the average? Our um, our questionnaire only went up to 20 standard drinks, right? And and so some of the guys told us they drank, you know, 30, 30 to, on the night. Well, did you guys pay for this or no? Wow. Okay. No, we just said you know go and do what, and, and they might have gone a little bit over the top, but um, they went and they. They claimed that that was a normal sort of standard standard night on the on the booze for those guys because it wasn't like the high. They're, they're not. Yeah, they're, they're pretty rugby team, relatively yeah. social. Yeah, sort of team relatively. I mean, it sounds yeah. it sounds pretty. Yeah, like they're there for a good time, not a long time. Yeah, it's a real life situation though. Yeah. It's the standards. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, and, and, it's, and yeah. you would see the same kind of behaviour with senior rugby players. Yeah, you know, you, you would. <coughs> Whether here or in the states, you know, I've talked to guys on podcasts in the states. And they're playing rugby for the social aspect, not because it's rugby and it's a great sport, it's because of the social side. So rugby players all around the world will drink like that, often. Um, so these guys had a massive night on the booze. They're, up until that night, so we looked at you know, sleep patterns, just reported, were they sleeping well? Um, the night that they went out, they only had three hours of sleep. You know, these other, so sleep deprived, severely hungover, um, and yet there was no effect on their performance the next day. Right? And there was no change in hydration status either. Right? So they've done everything that you shouldn't do. <laughs> their, their food diaries, you know, one guy, he ate three carrots on the Sunday after the night out, and another guy had five pies. So <laughs> as I was saying before, it changes the way you eat. So not only they're sleep deprived, they're hungover, <laughs> Their diet has been put all over the place, and yet there's no effect on their recovery the, the day after and the day after. Right? So that's and we we managed to publish that. that was recovery our, or performance? Recovery, right? Okay. So um, so that was interacting with the with the demands of a rugby game. Yeah. But the the problem was that well there was a small a small effect on their ability to produce lower body power output. So their vertical jump was down a little bit. Yeah. But not not massively. Yeah, yeah. they're not jumpers, right? Statistically down, but you know, not a, you know, a couple of percent probably. You know? Yeah, it's not like they couldn't get off the ground anymore. Um, so you kind of, I guess, the timing of it, the day after, it's that interaction between the game and the alcohol. So it's kind of a combination of recovery and the effects of a hangover, uh, and then the Monday morning was sort of recovery. So. Um, no effects there, and, and theory there was these guys had just come out of a rugby season. They're familiar with the demands of rugby. They're familiar with drinking. Okay, so uh, when we when we did the audit, which is the alcohol use disorder uh, identification test, so it's how you tell how much people drink on a regular basis. You can quantify people as a moderate drinker or a, you know hazardous drinker. Most of these guys were. Classified either as alcoholics or borderline alcoholics. Okay. Right? So they had a, a strong, they were very familiar with alcohol, mm. right? And therefore, I, you know, I think if the three of us went and, and did some sort of physical sport and then drank like that, well, I don't certainly don't drink like that. We would probably be worse than we are the next day and probably yeah. couldn't perform. Um, so there's a the potential that their baseline is relatively inhibited. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're trained. They're trained for alcohol consumption. Yeah. So we get an upregulation of alcohol dehydrogenase. Yeah. Right. So the more you drink, the greater this enzyme that's responsible for breaking alcohol down. It, it gets increased. It's like training. It is. It's absolutely. It's like training, and that's why um, alcoholics need to drink more to get the same effect of alcohol. 
because they're trained. So, what, so you can improve that that standard rate that you said, like seven yeah, grams you, an you hour. You can, yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. yeah. But with heavy training, heavy training. Yeah, well, like yeah. if you run once a month, you're not going to become like a way better runner. No, that's right. Like but you, if you're you drinking, need to commit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, if, are you doing this or not? Like, yeah, come on, <laughs> drink. <laughs> if you're drinking most nights of the week, you know, even you know, I don't know, three drinks most nights of the week, you're going to get that upregulation of alcohol dehydrogenase, and it's going to take more alcohol for you to feel that that good feel feeling that you you want from the alcohol. And then it's having an effect on the um, the centres of the brain that are responsible for um, for addiction as well. So you're, you're drinking more, and that's having that effect on the, the addictive side of things, and and you get hooked, and, and you need the stuff. Um, yeah. So that that study was interesting, and, and basically you publish that, and then the you know the Daily Mail in the UK say, you know. Rugby player, you can drink whatever you want. It's not going to have any effect on you whatsoever. Yeah. So how annoying would that have been for you to see, like? The media getting a hold of your research. That's what they want. I've seen this that's stuff right. everywhere. Like yeah. it's been published in all the cycling magazines, and like yep. they're citing your research. Yep. And like, oh, well, okay, I guess that's what it said. But how did you take that as your, re- you know, you're seeing your stuff? I mean, it's cool to get the recognition, I suppose. It gets your name out there, and you end up on your, um, you know. To sitting here talking to you guys. <laughs> um, you get on like the dopest endurance sports podcast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, I, and I've done, I've done interviews for um, Outside Magazine and, and Rock Climbing Magazines and Cycling Magazines and Runner's World and um, Men's Health and, and they're all trying to apply what I've just talked about to their particular situation. And as I've said, it's very specific. If muscle is damaged. That's the, that's going to be the issue, right? This is the problem with scientists. Like we, like, we're like, well, no, that's actually not what I did. Like, this is very specifically what yeah. I did. Yeah. And you're standing by that, right? <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a certain situation where alcohol is going to have a, a detrimental effect. That rugby city, these guys played each other. As I say, they're used to being knocked around and stuff. Unless one of them got a really severe soft tissue injury for the alcohol to interact with, it's probably not going to have any effect. Well, it didn't have any effect. Right, um, and then we we did we did another study kind of with the same group of guys, where we we wanted to see whether not interacting with the game of alcohol whether there'd be any different sort of effect. So they went out and they 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 got really boozed similarly uh, amount, um, and again no no effect. And that was I guess that's not the interaction with the game or recovery. That's just the effects of a hangover, and they were equally able to perform. Um, but again, it's context specific. They're heavy drinkers, um, but they were they're representative of um, student athletes for the most part, not individual student athletes, but team sports student athletes in any country in the world. Students drink more than the general population, and student athletes drink more than that. So, yeah, there's this combination, right? So, uh, not drink always, and this this is. The kind of pattern that you will see with most athletes, they abstain from alcohol during the week, they train hard and they'll drink after an event, say a game on a Saturday or a run or whatever, often as a reward for the hard work that they've put in or to celebrate or something like that. That's the, that's the general way. Often, unfortunately, we end up binge drinking, which is more than six standard drinks. Um, and if we binge on a regular um, basis, then that increases our risk of alcohol-related harm from a health and a mental health um, side of things. Yeah, so so those studies kind of we published those, and, and you don't want to turn around and say, "Yep, drink as much as you want," because there's still all those those negative effects on the rest of your body. You know, but in in like the acute sense, yep. it was not it's not yeah, yeah not de- yeah. not detrimental. You yeah, know? so um, context specific again. <laughs> if you're used to something, you'll get away with it probably. Yeah. 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 And the other studies that they've done, and that's just that's just most of the studies that I've been involved with, the studies overseas have shown that it needs to be a really high dose of alcohol to have any effect. So they've done the, the effects of alcohol after exercise on protein synthesis, um, and we're talking sort of oh those doses those doses were like twenty standard drinks or something something wow. really you know maybe not that high but it was a massive amount of alcohol, quite unrealistic to actually see. 
uh, uh, suppression and protein synthesis after resistance type exercise. I wonder how they got that through ethics. Yeah. And the, 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 the other lab that's done a lot of research stuff, aside from us, they had a model where they would they would use slightly higher dose um, than we used, and they drink it in twenty minutes. <laughs> oh wow! You know, so hammering it back to get the alcohol in the system. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's not realistic. So they, they looked at they've looked at um, mainly hormonal responses. You know, does it suppress testosterone? Does it affect cortisol? Um, my stuff shows has shown that it didn't have any effect. But that dose was a bit a bit lighter, probably. But they've shown that it, it may suppress testosterone. Certainly, we know that um, chronic, regular alcohol use does decrease your testosterone production. You know, shrink your testicles if you drink enough of the stuff over time. That decreases testosterone, increases estrogen in males, which leads to feminising characteristics. You increase the the amount of fat that you store around your around your belly. That's one of the that's one of the big differences. In fact, people as a general will have a lower BMI if they're a regular alcohol consumer, um, particularly females, but males tend to store it. We know beer gut, right? Store yeah. around there. That's one of the that's one of the effects that it has on males. So that's a combination of kind of a change in the way your body stores because of the change in estrogen, you know, um, can lead to hair loss, and breasts growing. Um, Probably not characteristics that you want to develop as a <laughs> as a young athlete if you're a male, right? Um, yeah. So quite quite the opposite. And for females, um, it's going to disrupt um, you know fertility and things like that as well. It plays havoc. Just changes the way you, your hormones are balanced as a female. Uh, increases the, the estrogen, as I sort of alluded to before. Um, so those are the kind of thing. If I'm educate trying to educate an athlete. And I'll tell them the truth, just like I am here. In a certain situation, it may not be that detrimental to you, but if every week you're drinking like that, over time, you know, your testicles are going to disappear, and you're going to, you know, you, you, and and a decrease in, in um, testosterone obviously has effects on bone density, on muscle mass, fat tissue, and all that sort of stuff as well. So, um, and then it can affect the way you sleep as well, you know. Um, while some people think having a drink might help you nod off, it can disrupt normal sleep patterns, and that in turn can can have an effect on the amount of growth hormone that's secreted at night, and may not necessarily allow you to recover as fully as you, as you want. So lots of lots of ways it can impair pretty much any system in your in your body, I guess. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, so yeah, they've looked at testosterone. There's been a bit done on females. I guess you've probably got a couple of female listeners out there. Um, what we found, we did a study in, in another lab, did a study on, on the muscle damage stuff, and we found no effect of, of alcohol on females, even at quite a high dose. Um, that may be due to estrogen protecting the, the muscle. They think that, that that might be the case. Uh, irrespective, it looked like you know alcohol didn't interact with the muscle damage and probably doesn't have the same effect as we showed with males. However, that doesn't mean that women should go out and get absolutely slaughtered on, on booze or whatever after exercise because there's, there's lots of other issues um, at play. So those are kind of the, I guess, the main studies that have been done. Um, the, the other stuff, that when we think about recovery, um, muscle damage is just one small thing and often if you've done exercise often enough, Muscle damage isn't really a big a big deal unless you've done something really quite different. I guess if you're a mountain runner or something, maybe the track's steeper or something, and you're not used to that, then you'll probably get some muscle damage. But as a general, if you're used just used to running, you probably don't get a lot of muscle damage. Your, your body will adapt to that eccentric pounding that the muscles are going to take. But um, where was I going with that? Um, I guess this kind of leads to like. Well, what does it actually mean for our listeners? Oh, you know, yeah, sorry. Like... <laughs> I'll, I'll come back in there, if that's, yeah. what, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, muscle damage is just one thing. We've got glycogen re- resynthesis as well, right? So after a long run, you've depleted your glycogen levels. You need to repl- replenish those. And wisdom or, or science says that you should do that quite soon after, particularly if you're going to train again the next day. Um, so they've, they've done some studies where... They've done, they've um, depleted glycogen and then they've given the one study Louise Burke did um, 
and others. Um, they depleted glycogen and then they, they did four, I think four different diets. And the, the only one, so they had a, a carbohydrate, um, they had a diet where alcohol displaced the calories from carbohydrate. And that was the only one that had an effect on the ability to resynthesis, uh, resynthesize glycogen. So alcohol by itself, when there's carbohydrate available, doesn't have an effect on your ability to resynthesize or store, store glycogen. It's only, and, and often this is the case if we go out drinking, and we replace, we start drinking, we don't necessarily eat, so we don't have that substrate to replenish the, the glycogen. That's the only case where alcohol is probably going to have an effect on your ability to, to store that glycogen. But that really wouldn't be in it. Most things you're going to drink are going to either have sugar yeah, or like exactly. carbohydrate yep, and yep. beer. Well, yeah. it, it doesn't take much, does it, to, to start replenishing your glycogen? No. You know, a sandwich or anything. And if you don't have to perform the next day, there's no massive hurry to, for that to happen, right? So it doesn't have to happen within the magic window of time or anything like that. If you're not going to perform the next day, same as hydration, there's no real hurry, you know, because you don't have to perform. So it's probably fine to, to go out drinking and, and not remember to eat carbohydrate if you're not going to perform the next day. Um, the other thing is hydration. Um, alcohol after exercise, because exercise may dehydrate you, alcohol doesn't make you more dehydrated. If you're already dehydrated, you can't get more dehydrated by drinking alcohol. So the body protects itself by kind of limiting the effects of, of that. So, um, yeah, if you're hydrated, well hydrated, then alcohol will dehydrate you. It's diuretic. But if you're already dehydrated, like post-run or whatever, drinking is not going to make that worse. But I would say you should still focus on replenishing glycogen levels and rehydrating before you do anything. That's just good practice irrespective of drinking or not drinking. Yeah. So those would be your main factors, repairing muscle, which it may inhibit, protein synthesis, at high doses it's going to have a detrimental effect, glycogen resynthesis, only if you don't supply the body with substrate, and hydration, if you're already dehydrated, probably not, not a problem. Yeah, And it's only at sort of uh, a relatively high dose that alcohol is really going to be have a diuretic, a really big diuretic effect. Yeah. Uh, that means just increasing urine production, I guess. Yeah. yeah. One of the interesting, like, for me, with the kind of sports I'm involved in now with, like, triathlon, running and stuff, people often take, I'd say, take it too seriously. So there'll be a low-key event, and maybe they've done really well, and you go out afterwards, and there's no one out. They might have, like, a specific post-race party. Yeah. And then, and it's like, I think from what you're saying, like, definitely, you know, not condoning getting pissed but it's fine to go out and have a few few drinks if you want to yeah like you don't need to be super strict on it um especially if it's like the last race of the season or something like that like that's oh yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean what's the worst that can happen i mean drive home and crash and get drunk and die but um, <laughs> you know as long as you're sensible you know because there's all those other social you know factors that drinking too much can, can do but physically i think absolutely drinking to Drinking to moderation is fine for anybody, irrespective of whether they're an elite athlete or not. Yeah. That's what the science suggests, right? The best thing to base our recommendations for is the World Health Organization guidelines around drinking, irrespective of who you are, because everything we know and that we've just talked about still fall, sort of falls under those, you know? So you're not binge drinking. You know, there's less than six drinks in a, in a session. Um, you know, I think it used to be no more than 21 drinks, standard drinks for a male a week and 14 for a female with at least a day or two where you're not drinking any alcohol. Um, you're only looking at a couple of drinks in a given session. That's moderate. You probably, although that probably needs to be changed a little bit given the, the more recent research. But the, the belief was that if you drink like that, your chances of harm to your health, mental and physical, isn't going to be dreadful, right? So as long as our athletes abide by those rules, their health is going to be not too badly affected by alcohol, and their recovery is probably going to be fine as well. So I think that's that's the best, most common sense when people say, well, you know, what, what do you reckon? Well, abstinence is unrealistic given our society, 
because everything revolves around alcohol for, for a lot of people. Deaths, births, Christmases, <laughs> weddings, birthdays. There's usually alcohol there somewhere. Drunk uncle sitting in the corner, you know, being creepy. Um, you know, that's De- just definitely the births. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's just society, and we can't expect our athletes not to be part of society. It's unrealistic. You know, they're, they're already placing lots of restrictions on themselves in terms of what they sacrifice for for time commitments and other stuff they're doing to not be able to be part of society and you can be you, you can be part of society you can go to a pub and you can drink coke or whatever it's probably not that good for you either but it might be worse you know, yeah um but drinking at a moderate level is not going to be that bad for you yeah and so I, I don't think taking that hard line is not sensible not realistic and just isn't necessary, you know. I've had, you know, people from magazines or, or, or TV shows or whatever contact me and they'll say really specific questions, you know, for our readers, if they're building up to a big event, what does, what, do, what should they do around alcohol consumption? It's like, man, well, there's no research on that. So I, I can't really, <laughs> you know, so you base it off everything that you know. And we've just, we've just covered all of the, all of the alcohol research around exercise in this conversation, but, so where do you take that? You say, well, it's probably not going to be that bad. You could still probably have one drink, maybe even two drinks the night before you race. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be that detrimental, particularly if you're used to it. If you're dr- used to having a couple of drinks in an evening and then you go out and you train the next day and you perform perfectly fine, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change the way your heart beats or the way your body circulates blood or uses, you know, because as I said, the alcohol, well, sort of, you know, two drinks going to be out of your system in a couple of hours. You go to bed, you get plenty of sleep, you get up, you run at 10 o'clock. Alcohol's not going to have any effect on you whatsoever. Yeah. So I, I think that's the best approach is just a common sense approach. You know? um, Sweet. I think that's probably a good, good place to, to finish up. Huh? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, thanks for your, thanks for your time. It's all good. It's cool. It's, uh, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. <Thank you. laughs> Long drive. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. Whoo, Matt. Wasn't that a good interview? <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Thanks, uh, Dr. Barnes, for coming on the show with us. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you.